FlintTalkRadio.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program, and we're very glad to have you out there this afternoon. We are here, as you know, from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock every Monday afternoon, and um, every second and fourth Mondays, uh, Ms. Catherine Hunter Williams and Ms. Catherine Blake come on from 3.30 to 4, and they are here every two weeks. We, our program is, is weekly. <clears throat> We're always very glad to have you aboard and love to have you uh, partake in the program at your leisure if you want to call in. The number here is area code 810-208-1854. I know that's true because it's over there on the monitor. And I think I'm in these two cameras over here. We have a lot of cameras in here, and I have to look around and see which ones are on each week because they're changing. I'll be looking over here, and the camera's over there. <laughs> but the light's on over here today. Okay, we are here for the next hour. It's 2.03 or so, and we're going to be here at 3 o'clock. I want to talk to you about three different topics today, and one of those is, of course, as you know, this is Labor Day. And I made a couple of uh, comments on Labor Day today and on my Facebook wall. And I had uh, forewarned everybody that I was going to be talking about who I think ought to be honored on this day. And I think that would be the capitalists and the businessmen and women who have not gotten their due about their role in terms of bringing the quality of life up from where it was before we had capitalism in this country. And I think that really, quite frankly, as I said on Facebook today that the capitalists have gotten a short end of the stick on a lot of our different levels. One of them is that the capitalist class has uh, not been rewarded with um, the credit that's been given to uh, labor. I don't know of anything that labor has done, quite frankly, that has brought about the quality of life we now have in the United States. Uh, for example, uh, we give um, Unions are credit for having created the eight-hour um, um, uh, work day and the 40-hour week. But that is uh, really owed to the capitalists as well because the capitalists who increase production by adding to the equipment base of their uh, businesses and also to add to the technology, which allow workers to become a lot more productive, and in becoming more productive, what, what happens is that you can, in fact, get more production done in a shorter amount of hours. And in that uh, respect, you have a chance to cut down the hours without hurting production. And you can increase the wage because production is up. And that's what the uh, unions have gotten a lot of credit for. But if you read some of the books and understand some about economics, you know that can't possibly be true. And what I raised on Facebook today, uh, by, by the way, was that uh, if you can, in fact, uh, join a union and then that raises your wages, uh, why don't we, in fact, take those unions over to all the, the poverty-stricken countries in the world and just let them unionize and see if that, in fact, grows their wealth? Oh, that's ironic that you brought that up about mm -hmm. the unions. Mm -hmm. Okay, Karl Marx in his books, you know, he always they talk to the appeal to the international workers. And unions originally started talking about, you know, international workers' rights and that was supposed to be international appeal. But they missed the boat. Um, they didn't start unionizing efforts in those countries before they're developed. Basically, they could have taken some of the funds from the union's uh, membership and started planting seeds and helping people in those underdeveloped nations. But they didn't. They started use, you know, political stuff that wasn't connected towards the, the workers' rights or anything or conditions. They started doing more radicalized political ambitions way beyond that. Mm -hmm. But the person who did the people who actually saw the opportunities in other countries were the capitalists. Were the capitalists, not the unionizers. Sure, and of course, Karl Marx was talking about moving in uh, Das Kapital that came out in 1869. He's talking about uh, moving from the capitalist system to um, the uh, socialist system, and then you have the Marxism uh, as a um, final uh, stop-off point, but. What do you do with those economies that are, in fact, primitive? And, uh, of course, I see what they're doing with, with what they're doing right now in the United States, but let's, let's get real with how we became the number one economic engine in the world, more productive than any economy that the world has ever seen, and that has to do with the fact that we have this tremendous entrepreneurial class that we poured water on their parade, uh, calling them all kinds of names, robber barons and things like that, which really have, have no um, credence when you look at the evidence. 
because if they are the producing class and you're saying they are robbing people, then they'll be robbing the people they um, actually have produced uh, the goods for, and then uh, in that production take the goods back they produce. And so, quite frankly, they're robbing from themselves because there's no wealth out there to rob before the capitalist class gets um, off the ground and does the things that it is, it is doing at the uh, milk pod of the 19th century. And I, th I think, quite frankly, we could date this around uh, the uh, 18, although some would put an earlier date than this, I put it around 1880. And at that point, you see uh, market capitalism taking off. And you see wealth being accumulated and created. And to some extent, capitalism in slavery. So uh, the slaves were workers, were workers, and how much wealth that they have. So if it's really about the workers, and we're talking about labor as the driving engine of an economy, look at how many uh, laborers you have in, a, in all of the countries of the world that are poor. They have laborers um, galore, all sitting on the sideline with nothing to do because they don't have that uh, particular class. And John, one thing that Ayn Rand said was that where you have the presence of this class, this capitalist class, you have the uh, presence of wealth and where that class is absent, uh, whether or not it's been allowed to form in the first place and doesn't exist for that reason, or whether it once existed and now no longer exists, when that class is absent, then poverty is present. <clears throat> and that's true everywhere in the world. That entrepreneurial class is pivotal to a uh, society. And when that class, the golden goose, so to speak, is in fact uh, done away with, we see the evidence of what happens in that situation all over the world. Well, you know... I don't know if you ever read the book or heard of the book Representative Men by Rolf Wilder Emerson. It was a book that um, Nietzsche utilized a lot of the ideas, the kind of the the point behind that point of the book to uh, create the idea of the Ubermensch, which has been perverted and corrupted, but that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, for one thing, he wasn't a Nazi supporter at all. He would not have been on board for that. But anyway, um, there is the major thrust of Representative Men that Nietzsche later picks up at Ubermensch and all that stuff is that... Um, it's a handful of people who pull the rest of society forward. Mm -hmm. And he used in his book, he used some people we're familiar with, but also people like Swedenborg, the most average, you know, modern day listener wouldn't even have any ideas about Emanuel Swedenborg. But he also talks about all these other great philosophers and stuff like that. And Ayn Rand kind of parallels that. I don't know if she does it willingly or whatever, but it is a handful of people that pulls the rest of humanity out of the suffering. Mm -hmm. And then later on there, but the thing is, as Nietzsche would talk about, is they never underestimate the power of resentment. People now are working for these people. And a lot of those conditions are horrible in the shops. I mean, I grew up in this town. I, mm -hmm. I have no reason to doubt the right. claims these people made. But this was not a union town unlike the, I mean, this was not a factory town like the, the old coal mine towns where like Pennsylvania and Virginia or whatever, or West Virginia. You can move out of them, Okay. The, uh, the uh, corporations that were doing bad behavior against their, their employees, because there's such an well, uh, open playing field, you could just move transition to a place that treated you better. And the person at the place that either didn't treat you well, eventually would either had to start treating their workers better or go out of business because he couldn't recruit the workers. Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference. They didn't have the coercive element that a government would have over you. That's, that's exactly the point made by... Thomas uh, De Lorenzo in his book called How Capitalism Saved America. And what De Lorenzo says in that book is that the factory owners could not compel the workforce to move from the farms into the factories. And although, the, as you said, the conditions were not optimal in the factories, they were better than what they had and were paying more uh, uh, wages than what they could make on the farm. Otherwise, they would not have moved. And they were not optimal conditions based upon the circumstances we have now in the 21st century. But let's always understand that when you have startup capital, you're not going to have the optimal conditions because you don't have the capital infusion to make those conditions better. What you have to compare it with, though, is what were the conditions like that they came from. And for the slaves, we know what the conditions would be in their case. They were workers, and we know what kind of conditions they were working under. And for the... Um, the yeoman uh, class, we know what kind of condition they were working under as well. And so the condition, as bad as it was in terms of the wages and the condition and things of that sort, um, were in fact uh, bad by these standards. But those standards will change as the capital investments pay off and they're able to expand and 
by equipment and technologies and things of that sort to make the workers more productive. And out of that comes everything else that you see that's taking place. So we've given the wrong credit to the uh, unions and workers about the contribution really be, should have been made and given to the capitalist class and made all of that possible. But that's a class right there. And really, it's never going to be a majority of all the people. There's a certain uh, group that has yet to, get, to be given its due that really, is, is, as Rand said in, in 1957, just shrugged their shoulders and just uh, simply uh, walked away because of all of the uh, stress that's put out there to stop them from doing the kind of things they can do. Uh, no appreciation for the uh, quality of life they brought that was not there in their absence. We see the difference between what it was like before they came on the scene and what it was like after they arrived on the scene. And uh, we see that. And, and, and uh, to have um, uh, the uh, response to their efforts to be a strike against their businesses, uh, shutting them down, um, uh, takeovers of the plants and things of that sort, and then regulation on the part of the government, which is another factor. Uh, what do they do under those circumstances? And what she said, they, they, uh, what, what John Galt did was he shrugged and uh, just simply uh, uh, decided to, to, uh, to leave. And, that, and that's what we see going on right now. They're leaving, and it's going to be interesting to see, to see how this ends up. But uh, socialism, which is where we're heading, and have been on this road for a long time, at least for since uh, the beginning of Labor Day, which was first installed in 1894. This was the first time we had the national holiday called Labor Day, when there were 30 states that, in fact, already embraced it, and the federal government came in and did nationalize the holiday based upon the fact that a lot of states are, had already bought into it. But this is kind of like a mis... I, I said this in my statement today. This is kind of like a misappropriation, really, of where the appreciation should go. And I'm advocating for the business class because I know exactly who calls the country to stand as it's standing. And we are, we're not aware of it, so we're losing that element. And we begin to look a lot like other parts of the world because... We are killing the golden goose that laid the eggs here for us that made us different from the rest of the world. They did not have uh, the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the uh, Andrew Carnegie's and, and uh, the, uh, uh, this, these railroad uh, builders and, and other entrepreneurs that laid a foundation for it and all of those persons that, that laid uh, the groundwork for the industrialization that occurred in this country that made us the economic engine of the entire world. It's interesting to see how powerful that was because even though we've been removing capitalism from the economy bits and bits and, 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 and piece by piece and, 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 and piecemeal on a regular basis, just continuing to analyze the movement of this country toward a socialist uh, path, on a socialist path, it's interesting to see that even the fumes of capitalism is able to uh, maintain itself to a certain extent through the creativity of capitalism. And even though uh, there are all these chains placed upon the capitalist um, uh, economy, it's still able to uh, create a path to which it can maintain itself even under this kind of duress. Because I'm, I'm convinced that um, Obamacare and, and those kinds of things are the are designed not so much for the health care as it is to bring business more so under the under the um, command and power of the, of the federal government. You know, a few years ago, I was, I was dealing with a Marxist. I mean, I think it was in the studio. And we're talking about what made America but different, better than the rest of the world. And he was a Marxist, he was a socialist, whatever you want to call it. You know, I know there's a, there's a, there's distinguishing things between the two, but, you know, for this, this sake of argument. Anyway, he actually said that. Many, he named this writer who was a Marxist-leaning mar writer solidly on that camp, but mm -hmm. actually said that um, they all come to the agreement that capital, capitalism was a vehicle for by which societies could be, be best developed. Mm -hmm. See, basically, though, you're talking about the point. I think you're, they depend upon a great deal of things already in place so this socialist revolution can take place. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's, and that's, and that's the three stages by the right. entrepreneurial class. Mm -hmm. And you need to have um, capitalism, which is, wh why would they need to start off saying that capitalism is the foundation point, and then you go through uh, from there to socialism, and then from there to communism, and why would they need to have the, uh, the capitalist system in place to bring about the uh, other two levels in which we'll, end to the, we'll get to the final end 
of that development because wealth is not created in the other two. <clears throat> and so uh, what they really were calling for uh, was the uh, capitalism to create the wealth to which then the distribution can, can occur under the latter stages of what they thought would be the final ends of, of economic uh, egalitarianism. But we have yet to see any of that uh, play out. And it's unfortunate, quite frankly, that America is now moving down the path of, uh, of countries that have gone down that road. And they're coming back toward uh, capitalism, having found out that that doesn't work. And now they're coming back this way, and we're going down the other way. I was looking at a, at a poll last week. It was uh, in one of the magazines. And it showed uh, where we are now on the scale of the freest economies in the world. And it showed that we've dropped a couple of places uh, down from where we were. Um, I was looking at, um, uh, uh, by the way, Hong Kong is number one. And then Singapore is uh, number two. And then they started uh, uh, talking about, um, I think, somewhere Thailand is in there. And uh, I, was, I was surprised to find Chile. Chile is number five or number six. <clears throat> and uh, Sweden is number four. That's where Oprah was. And we're down there now in terms of the freest economies of the world. We're down there now on some polls that got us at number 10. Some got us down as far as number 18. Restrictions, I mean, John Stossel did that years ago. He went and, you know, he um, started up a, tried to start a business here in the United States, and he compared it and contrasted to starting up a business in Hong Kong, which was already turned over to the Chinese at this point. And he just had to fill up one form, and he was already selling Frisbees out on the street there in Hong Kong. Go up so to the window? In one form. Mm -hmm. Just it was on side one paper. Yeah, three, four questions and some. Uh, one piece of paper and go up to the window and, and file your papers and you're in business when you walk away from the window. <clears throat> um, we're, we're just like Nigeria and, every, and, and the way it uh, works here now. You have to have all these different entities. You got to go in, and go to this place and have this approval, go over here and get this license. And uh, some of it takes all that paperwork, some of it takes two and three years <clears throat> to get your plan off the ground. Where in, in Hong Kong, it's like, you know, what is it, uh, a three-minute uh, drop-off, and then you're back at your place of business getting ready to operate based upon the fact that the process was very simple. American Express Card's got a, a ad going on right now, a commercial, and it shows, like, you got this idea, I think it is American Express, and then it takes, and it takes a year. I mean, they just said it, you know, casually. But, I mean, if you look at the, what you're pointing out, from that time to that time, some foreign competitor has got to jump on us. Got to jump Very on quickly. us because their business uh, model is is uh, a lot easier to uh, get through whatever minefields are out there. And we are, we, I, I don't, we're, we're anti-business right now. And I, I see that in terms of, of uh, this misdirection that we have in terms of giving labor. Well, labor is everywhere. You know, people are, they, we have to work. I mean, you're not a breatharian where you can just breathe the nutrients out of the air and uh, get all the nutrients and vitamins that you that you need because we're not made breatharians we were we were intended it was intended for us our purpose is to work to take the uh, the land and develop it otherwise you would be able to just simply breathe and and not have to do anything that was not the intention but we all have workers the question is what do you uh, have the workers doing and who is that business group that is in fact driving that and where they have that group that's in place, and we didn't have it in place in this country, um, uh, particularly in the latter part of the 19th century, <clears throat> that other countries did not have, we saw what that did here and what it did elsewhere. And we also see what's happening now that that group is being erased by the uh, federal um, uh, takeover that's taking place in terms we're now about at least 40%. Some people are saying 45% now uh, socialists in this country. <clears throat> but we are at least 40% with the uh, Obamacare kicking in. We are at least a 40% social economy right now. So we're, we're, we're continuing to, to decline in terms of the free aspects of our economy. And as long as that is happening and that erosion is taking place, every Labor Day, and I guarantee this is going to happen, every Labor Day you're going to have less and less and less to um, celebrate in terms of what labor is producing because your production will go down under a non-capitalist model, and we're not, and we're moving away from that model. You know, uh, every year we're doing more so, and more so every every year. When I was a teenager, I got into the writings of Voltaire, you know, the French philosopher, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, in the line of one of his poem, uh, his stories, he has this man saying, um, "Labor keeps at bay three great evils: boredom, vice, and need." 
And I thought that's my model. I mean, and mm-hmm. even though I'm not working every day like I used to at the university, that intense, and that was a pretty intense job. Mm-hmm. It's you, you have to have some kind of labor you have to do. Well, what it was, the, some of these utopianists or these socialists have, and these union people have this mentality that work's a horrific experience that's got to be endured, so you've got to put limitations on the people who you, these people are working for. They're, 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 and the thing is, they're actually, uh, their mentality is nobody actually draws any kind of anything other than just a paycheck from their labor. And it's like, I think that's really um, schizoid. It's insane to say that because, I mean, I've, let's face it, and another thing is, too, there is also a big push. Why do we identify with what we do in our lives? And I can see some variants of why that might be a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, I like that about Americans. We used to identify with what we did. Mm-hmm. Because basically, we are free to choose that what we were associated with. And you get your th- and, and and Abraham Maslow said you get your therapy from uh, your job uh, in his book called the Psyche and Management. Uh, he was saying that the job enforces who you are, and through your job, you uh, are getting a certain amount of therapeutic um, um, help in terms of how you see yourself and how you see your value based upon what you were bringing to your work uh, uh, experience. And so we all got to work, but somebody got to provide something for the greater numbers to do. And we see the, I never thought I would see the time, quite frankly, when <clears throat> the entrepreneurs would leave out of this country and go elsewhere and uh, take the, um, the, the money, the capital out of the country and carry it to some other part of the world. I never thought I would see that because it was this place that was um, the uh, light on the hill, the, 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 um, the house on the hill, so to speak, <clears throat> that all the rest of the world wanted to come into our house. <clears throat> and it was here <clears throat> that capital would flee from where it was and flee here because here was a grounding point. And now we're seeing, I think I read a statistic the other day that said a thousand people have re- renounced their American citizenship. It's not just Ted Cruz who is doing it to position himself next year, uh, and really in, in um, three years run for president in 2016. Um, there are people renouncing their citizenship because they're finding greater economic advantage elsewhere than they're finding here in the United States. By the way, did you know, did you know that Dianne Feinstein, is, she's got dual citizenship with the United States and Israel? Who is that? Dianne Feinstein. Feinstein. A senator from the United States has got citizenship as well with uh, Israel. Mm-hmm. That's got to be, that's going to be addressed. We cannot permit that. That's a conflict of interest, it's especially of interest. in that part of the world. And, and particularly being a member of the uh, Congress from California, uh, that's got to be some conflict of interest. It's just interesting how they don't in, uh, see the need mm-hmm. to pledge an allegiance to the country. You know, uh, to me, t- uh, John, that's another example of how our members mm-hmm. of Congress do not, first of all, have an allegiance to the country as its first priority. Everything is, is, is like the country is, is uh, secondary. And, le- and that lets me move on to uh, this issue <clears throat> that I, I brought here. I, I came here to talk about as well the Time Magazine issue on the unhappy warrior it calls it, which is of course excuse me, the situation we have in, in Syria. And you would think those guys would have come back. You know, they're on vacation right now and they won't be back until the ninth uh, next Monday, <laughs> you would have thought that they would put in the country first. You know, you're on vacation, but we have a crisis here. And you would have thought, Diane Feinstein, as you and others, that somebody would have said, "We have to go back to Washington right now and deal with what looks like a pending and imminent uh, move on the part of the president without the uh, askings of the." Uh, branch of government that is really given the authority in Article 1, Section 8 to declare war in this country. The president cannot declare war. And even though it is not necessarily a formal declaration, I think that the Constitution requires the president to um, to get some authority from the uh, Congress for any action that he takes. And they just can't pass his office. The Constitution is not, is not there saying that this can go on for 30 days and then you can get back with me later and things of that sort. The Constitution has a specific reference to war making, and whether you declare it or not, if if somebody if some, if someone comes over here and they attack Washington D.C., isn't that war? You don't have to declare it. If you launch a missile over here, um, that is warfare. And I and I remember in nine one one, when that first plane flew to that building, they said that um, they thought it was an accident at first, 
And then when that second plane hit the uh, towers, then they said, we are at war with somebody, but we don't know who it is. But they knew they were at war. And they didn't have to find out if, if the place that attacked us had declared war. Those planes flying into that building indicated we were at war with somebody. Now we have to identify who it is. But there was no question about that being warfare. So when it says that the Congress has the power to declare war in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, um, that's, that's Congress. But you thought you would think those guys would have rushed back into uh, Washington and said, we got to be sitting here in all deliberateness for, on behalf of the country so that we can have the check and balance system in place so that anything the president wants to invoke, we're here to give our approval or not give our approval on, the, on behalf of the American people because we are the people's representatives in all of the uh, states, not just the president who's the national figure. They are the local officials, and they are given the um, authority to, in the House, to be, to be the people's voice, and that's where the war-making uh, power with the power of the purse, it begins in the House. I mean, if, if you're talking about the purse strings, I mean, that's in the people's body. But no, they haven't rushed back to Washington because it's like the country is not the first grounding point of their influence. They want to um, talk about their uh, political careers. And, I, and I'm, I'm gonna be, it's going to be really interesting when they get back to, uh, to Washington next week, uh, speaking about Syria, with the president holding off, he's not going to go in there yet. He's going to wait until Congress gets back, and they are going to get in consultation with each other. And the president is going to make a determination about whether or not to do the strikes based upon his conversation with, with uh, Congress, saying he has um, the information to show that sarin gas was used by the Assad administration. Now, I must, I must say this. I don't believe that's, that. that the, I don't, that, to me, that would be a, an act of suicide on Assad's uh, behalf. And I don't think the man is crazy. He's definitely a tyrant, and he's a bloodthirsty um, uh, uh, murderer. There are 100,000 people that have gotten killed in this uh, warfare in uh, Syria. And I want to say civil war in Syria because you have uh, the Syrian people on both sides that are fighting. And really it's Al-Qaeda out there fighting on one side. They're the ones fighting on the side of the rebels in Hezbollah, which shows you the Iranian influence in the war. And that's uh, on the side of Assad. And they're saying this is a proxy war he's fighting uh, on behalf of Iran. But it's a civil war, nevertheless, and everyone is up in arms about the sarin gas, which killed about 1,400 people. And then, and I was listening to John Kerry yesterday. He was talking as if because there's sarin ga gas tissue, there's, uh, there's sarin in the tissue of the hair follicles of people that died, that they can therefore determine that, that the sarin gas is used by Assad. You know, I listened to him on, on Chris Wiles' show yesterday, and I wasn't convinced. He was stumbling all over the place trying to uh, find some way to justify how that is conclusive proof that the gas was, in fact, used by, by Assad. You know, that would be suicidal. And I don't think that Assad used it because, number one, he didn't have to use it. Though, uh, the the Al-Qaeda, which is um, the group that's in the rebel uh, forces, they're pretty much the ones that's running it. Uh, any allies we had were in the very formative parts of this opposition to Assad, and they've been pushed to the side. Now al Qaeda's has taken over, which means the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, in the uh, mix there. The fact is that we don't, we, we really don't have any, 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 any dog in this fight because we've been fighting Al-Qaeda al in Afghanistan, and now we're going to use the military to uh, come and fight on this side in Syria. That's the side we're going to, to um to side with. And the other side is Hezbollah, that's just as bad. Really, uh, Sarah Palin had the right the right uh, idea. And her idea was, let a lot uh, figure it out. Let both sides, you know, come to a conclusion based upon uh, the Al-Qaeda forces fighting against the Hezbollah forces. And whoever comes out on top, that's who we got to deal with. But why are we getting involved in it? Another thing is, too, you got Kerry who you know, went on about using his uh, his term as time as he was in the uh, Vietnam as like being an anti-war person. But now he's a Secretary of State with a man. Basically, 
what well, that can be summed up in my opinion. I hope you don't take offense at it. But Obama was the first black president. We got to give him his own war. Because damn it, he's got to have a war to call his own. <laughs> because if you don't, you're a racist. If we're a racist nation if we don't let Obama have his own war. Yeah, he got to spend money. He's got to have spend money too, like everybody else, you know. Yeah, but as a black person, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Here's what uh, they're putting out. Uh, James Rawson, who is uh, the White House um, uh, writer, the, the White House um, press um, a reporter from Fox, has said that uh, there is an underlying uh, tone that he's picked up that they're going to call Congress back into session to meet with Congress, consult with them and all of the other, but they're going to bomb Syria regardless of what Congress says. <clears throat> and if that happens... If they, if they tell the president no, and the president goes forward with the bombing anyway, as a black person, I and some others are going, would be, would be calling in the, in the forefront of calling for the president's impeachment. And don't forget impeachment, just the accusation of wrongdoing while in the office. That is, in fact, the charge brought forth in the House. It takes a majority vote to bring that about. Well, look at the Iran Contra affair during the Reagan era. Okay, I don't. I didn't agree with Reagan's idea to what he did there. I didn't. I wanted him impeached then. I wanted him. I mean, I'm not a big glory hound. I don't. I don't love uh, Reagan. He had a lot of good things I appreciated, but that one instance where he subverted the Constitution, he should have been pulled out. We of have office to pull back, and we've got to get back to the place where the Constitution does have uh, some validity in the decision making in this country. And what happens in, in Washington, quite frankly, is that they don't even consider uh, the the Constitution when making decisions. Uh, uh, this one person from Florida, Alcee Hastings, uh, who was the discredited judge, this guy was impeached, by the way, when he was a judge down in Florida. He's now sitting there <laughs> as a member of the House of Representatives. They impeached him, and he came back as a, as a member of that body that impeached him. He was impeached in the House, tried in the Senate, and there was so much malfeasance of, of, while he was in office as judge, you know, taking money under the table and things like that. They had, to, they, they had no other choice than to remove this guy. He came back and ran for the uh, uh, Congress. And he sits there. He's the one that told us that the, the law is what we say it is. And he said that right in front of our face without apology. He wasn't trying to uh, excuse himself from having said it, didn't apologize for it. And he meant that, that the law is what they said is. What about the Constitution? Do we still have that? And does it still apply in terms of it being supposedly, and so it is certainly is supposed to be, the uh, law of the land that guides the behavior of the three branches of government? It delegates certain authority to each one, and under that you're supposed to act a certain way. And a checking and balance system is supposed to be in place to make sure that you don't overstep the boundaries that, in fact, drawn around your particular part of the uh, government. But, but when he was going through the impeachment process, he was using that very law to try to protect himself, to hide behind. I guarantee that. Oh, yes. And, John, I'll tell you what I think is going on here with him calling the Congress back and waiting until they get there. I think this president, and we have to look at this very carefully, and I look at it through the lens of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. This president um, has the um, precedent of being able to launch those missiles in Syria, from a thousand miles away, you know those missiles are pretty accurate, and if you can you can you can hit a, a, a dam uh, with those missiles if they are uh, 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 guided correctly and have the right um, uh, what do they call those things those those lines um, uh, coordinates call them coordinates and have the right coordinates you can you can you can pinpoint those those things to hit uh, this building and not that building although it have some residual effects on the other buildings but you can pinpoint that are uh, being targeted to that particular uh, location. And you're going to fight it a thousand uh, miles away. Well, the president can do that. But, so then the question is then, what is really going on with calling the Congress in session waiting after he had a talk out in the Rose Garden with this um, White House chief of staff named Dennis um, Dono, who took over from James Liu, and uh, he's now the chief of staff for the president. They went out and talked to him in the, in the Rose Garden uh, because they didn't want to be, be uh, heard talking in the, the White House. They went outside, and that says a lot because uh, they were afraid of being uh, uh, taped uh, also. Somebody, in, other, <laughs> in other words, the government 
uh, the, the president is a, is um, leery of, of his conversations being taped. And if they can't trust the uh, the government, and they are the government, then you know how we we should feel about uh, about about them up there in, in uh, Washington. But I think what what Dennis McDonald uh, I don't know um, I convinced him of is that we can hold off and get more than this because they got the right to launch those missiles. I mean, people have done that in the past. Reagan did it. So I don't think there's any problem with that. So why are they calling Congress back in session? I think this is a gut for talking resolution moment. You know, uh, in terms of get, get, the, get the Congress to agree to the president's provocative actions in Syria, which if they give him that, I think that goes beyond the pale. And I'm really, it's really interesting the president's been trying to convince the public that he has very limited aspirations. I'm just going to be over there a couple of hours, lunch, you know, maybe 250 uh, Tommy Hall cruise missiles, and we're going to pull out and come back home and things of that sort. He keeps saying that. We're not going to topple the Assad regime and very limited. Well, okay, that's what you're saying. But if you get the authorization and the claim is that there were some things that were not fortuitous, the things you didn't see, some unintended consequence, then that could lead to a much larger war. And I think that's what this authorization by Congress is about. Because this president is going to go into Syria whether Congress authorizes it or not. So what is that about then? It cannot be about launching uh, Tommy Hall cruise missiles. It's got to be about something bigger than that. And that's how you get into it to start out with. But I don't think this president is going to be satisfied until Assad is toppled. Because what this president is doing is uh, putting the Muslim Brotherhood in place. And John, have you noticed that he wanted to last week, the president wanted to make sure that his logs or who has visited the White House were in fact sealed? Did you read that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is the president who promised us more transparency. Well, we've got no transparency from this president. And why would this president not want the American people to see who's been visiting their house, the one they're paying uh, taxes for? That's the uh, people's uh, house. Well, he's working on getting he and Michelle's retirement funds together. That's what he's doing. And, so. and meeting with... Um, some bad guys behind the scenes that he doesn't want the American people to know about. But we know that we know uh, from the reports that the Muslim Brotherhood has been visiting with, with this president on a regular basis, the one he tried to install in Egypt. He said he would stand with the Muslims right in his book, The Audacity of Hope. He said he would stand with the Muslims. I read that comment, and, and, it, and it bothers me to this day <clears throat> because I see the president actually carrying it out in terms of whenever there's something to do with uh, the Muslims or Christians, the Muslims are always the ones that's advantaged, and the ones that are at the short end of the stick are the Christians. In fact, over in Egypt, uh, given his policies over there, bringing the Muslim Brotherhood in there, the ones that are burning churches right now, I think they've burned about 60 churches at this point, <clears throat> and um, the Coptic Christians that are both being decimated over there, and the ones who are living here were asking the president, so Mr. President, why don't you like us? <clears throat> because they see what his policies are doing over there in Egypt. And I just think it's, it's quite interesting that Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah, and both those groups are umbrella groups of um, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an umbrella group for all of them, because the, the Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest of the groups, having been founded in 1928. And so uh, it's interesting that uh, this president is saying, oh, our, our uh, aspirations are limited. We just want to go over there and punch for sarin gas and things of that sort. But he wants to get authorization from Congress. Well, you have the authority to go and bomb, you know, cast some bombs over there, from a thousand miles away without having the authorization of Congress. You get them that resolution, Congress. But Jordan's already said that U.S. can't use their, their territory for, uh, you know, for st staging operations. Okay, I didn't know that, yeah, but I'm not surprised. That that's a, right there, it's a big impairment for that's, his yeah. plans. Well, we, we saw the slap in the face, too, when Great Britain, I mean, we, who would have thought that our staunchest ally in Europe would have given the ultimate insult uh, uh, saying in essence that they had no confidence in the president and the policies of the United States of America that has been as such as an ally uh, over the years and you remember after 9-1-1 uh, they, they had uh, the prime minister sitting in the Congress and I remember Obama, I remember uh, Bush saying uh, I want to thank my, my faithful friend and was talking about the Prime Minister of, of, of England, who was right there in the Congress after 9 -1 and was standing shoulder to shoulder with the United States. It's something when you go to your strongest ally and you can't get them on board. Look, well, look, you and I talked about this in private conversation before. 
I think it has their their reluctance to join with us on the, uh, you know us. Not that I want to be on part, but the United States, mm -hmm. um, because let's face it, the contemptuous attitude which uh, Obama's displayed towards Great Britain I don't since think he's, he's taken office. Sending the bus back, Winston Churchill, back to England. Unbelievable. I mean, that is such a... And then giving the uh, the, uh, the Queen, as a gift, CDs of your speeches. Yes. I, the, the, he's been... A, the man has been assaulting, quite frankly, any of our allies, and he got it back in his face last week when the British told him through the Parliament they're not going to stand with him. And uh, that... Um, and then France was pretty much telling him that we all support you as long as you let us stay on the sideline and we applaud what you're doing. But they weren't actually talking about committing any military... Uh, force behind uh, going into Syria. They're going to applaud the United States going in. Another thing is, too, England and Germany and the rest of Europe has got a lot of Muslims living amongst their midst. And so if they take us out, anything that might be a move against Islam is they're going to catch hell. They're going to catch hell. Now, I think there's one fact in Britain in, in, in terms of why Britain did the things that it did. It had to, it had to concern itself with how does that affect the national politics in their own backyard because they know the aggression that we've been seeing in, in uh, Britain and, and that has not calmed down. And that could have created a, a firestorm, uh, but I think it says some too about about Obama's leadership and the confidence they have in Obama as an international uh, leader. This was a this was a tremendous uh, insult, and so now the president is uh, is saying for all to hear that his um, intentions in Syria are very limited, and he's going to um, go in for a couple of days. As if he knows ahead of time what serious response is going to be, go in for a couple of days, and that's going to be it, and maybe a couple of hours, he'd be out. And he keeps saying that, and and by the president saying that, that he'll be, it'll be in and out. That in of itself raises questions, and the and then the, to have Dennis um, Dono to go out and talk to him in the Rose Garden as they're walking around and discussing this, and then deciding not to go off with, not to uh, take action um, after all until Congress comes back a week from the day, that raised serious questions to me, and I think something, something is going on here amiss that we have yet to be told. I'm, that's why we have to watch it uh, when they get back, because I think that the president is trying to lobby Congress for support to create a larger war. I don't think this president is going to be willing to leave Assad in power because this is about the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. And, there, and, and, and John, the reason why Assad would have, been, uh, had to have, would have had to have been a lunatic to launch those, um, uh, those uh, modules, those capsules with uh, serine gas in it is because he's winning that war. Those guys are now hemmed in. That, the, the, the Syrian army has... Al Qaeda and those fighting alongside of us, basically Al Qaeda, though, and they're boxed in right, at, right uh, in one of the uh, areas of Damascus. They're boxed in there, and they're they're going to decimate that group. They didn't need to have the Syrian uh, gas, and there are some reports that I've read where the information is that the Al Qaeda forces released that gas in order to provoke the entry of the United States because they're in fact losing this war. And I wouldn't put it past them because I've seen some things Glenn Beck put on the uh, air um, uh, where uh, these persons that's out there in Al-Qaeda who had killed some of the enemies were in fact disemboweling them and uh, eating some of their body parts and things like that, which they put that on, on tape. I, I had to, he asked people to to spread this out and to, to give it out to people they are Facebook friends. But I, I did share it, share it with people that's on my, on my wall because I was horrified by what I saw. And they are, in fact, getting creamed by the uh, Syrian army. They haven't topped uh, Assad in two years. And I don't see a groundswell of support within his military that's abandoning him. And until that happens, you can't, you can't get rid of this guy. The military is as strong in back of Assad now as they were at the beginning of the war. And I don't see any defections going on, as happened in Egypt, by the way, when the Muslim brother was in power. Those, that was the vice president stepped down. You know what's bizarre? We don't see any of that in, in Syria. What's bizarre is this is, but in that part of the world, a, people like, a person like Saddam Hussein actually is probably preferred to what we got now. Because he, we knew where he was going to probably do that. As a matter of fact, he was actually much more ecumenical, if you want to call it, to the different religions and different ethnic groups within his boundaries, except for the Kurds, than any other person we've backed. 
And uh, you will say there's certainly he was certainly more tolerant of Western ways and ideas of democracy or whatever than, um, say, Saudi Arabia is. We should have left um, uh, Saddam Hussein in power. We see what Iraq has become in the absence of a strong uh, leader. We were right to back uh, Saddam Hussein in, his, in the fight against Iran because we had um, a, a Muslim fanatic in power under the Ayatollah Khomeini who had come to power when they run in 1979. So in that war that broke out the following year between these two combatants, uh, the U.S. sided with, with um, Saddam Hussein because of the fundamental Islamic regime that was in place next door. I can understand that. But Saddam had a strong hold over the Muslims in Iraq. We see what's happened in the absence of, of Saddam Hussein. And, and and Saddam Hussein was not, and we know, and all the records are now very clear about that. Had no role in 911. He was been a fool to have any role in it. Yeah. And he was, in fact, keeping the lid on in a country which is very volatile and can come apart at the seams if you don't have a strong leader. We, you know, use, we just have to wait until uh, they are ready for democracy. You just can't impose it from the outside. And we, uh, we this want a idea. We want a democratic form of a republic, too, by the way. That's, we don't want a true democracy anywhere, because if we want to back it, that could de degenerate into horrific things itself. Yeah, and some countries are just not ready for that right now. It's not that you can just import it uh, into countries that have no tradition of that, and uh, there is no tradition of that. Uh, you have to, first of all, have to be a you have to be a civil society. Well, that's what our culture <coughs> depended upon. That's the reason why a government and civic, uh, civics class was so important in United States history and our education. Mm -hmm. But now that eroded during the 60s because then they use that, that very same pro classes to attack everything the United States has ever done to make it always look like they're the bad guy. They didn't give it a broader picture of the students. And so they basically diminished the, the idea, the role of what education was supposed to be about in that respect. Mm -hmm. So basically mm -hmm. it caused that. That's what we allow these people who to come the education system so they can actually plant a seed of total hatred against their own people. Yeah, and they're, and they're doing, and that's another part of what is happening here in terms of the Islamization of America from within. And I think that we have to, got to pay a, a lot more attention to what's going on in the politics because a lot of it is stuff now. It's not like the kind of in-your-face approach that we saw in the 1960s when people were out there and we saw the radical French uh, out there on the margins and edges of society, and they were out here throwing all these invectives at the government and things of that sort, bombing the Pentagon. Uh, I don't. That, that's just not the way they, they they lost coming that way. So now we're seeing a more subtle approach in terms of brick by brick, piece by piece, uh, doing what Sewell wrote about called dis, dismantling America. And we see that going on in full, full uh, steam of the head, but in a very stealth kind of uh, manner where it can't be detected. But a lot of people are writing about, this is not the America I was, I was born in. And I, I saw a tape last night on Facebook that really bothered me out of Philadelphia where there was one uh, person. This person uh, was a, a woman that had served in, in the military. She was a veteran, had a guitar, and they're out there in the park. They just had a demonstration against the uh, U.S. getting involved in Syria. And she'd been asked to, to, to leave, and she's under a tree, not, not bothering anybody. And there were people uh, filming what, she, what was going on, and they grabbed her, four or five of these officers grabbed her uh, and physically accosted her. I'm, I'm going to try to send this tape that, that, that is made of that uh, to the national media because uh, they just simply... It was amazing what was going on, and they were, and, and the and the and the persons that was filming it said, uh, "Sir, she's not resisting. She's not resisting, sir." And they were saying, uh, "Stop resisting." She wasn't resisting. How, how could she resist? They had her head down across the fence, holding her head down, had her arm behind her back, which it seemed like they were trying to break her arm off. And then it said she was kicking them, which you can't kick anybody. <laughs> you can't kick anybody when you're down in that position. And they well, grabbed let us, let us brutalize you, and then we'll say sorry afterwards, okay? Let us yeah. brutal, break your bones, hurt, do some internal damage. But afterwards, we'll apologize, and we'll have a group hug, okay? That's on tape, John. And if, if those officers are not uh, disciplined, then what she was saying is, is indeed correct. And she was saying, we're living in a, in a, in a, in a police state. And she's correct, even if, and she's correct 
even if they don't say that well, because of the things that are going on. Right around country. here, they're stopping to do stop and frisk and stop and ID things right at the state it's police are right it's in this neighborhood. Yes. I just did it to my friend yesterday. It's, it's very worrisome to me because I, I was raised in a country that I just really had tremendous respect for. I'm still, I have a lot of respect for the country. I just don't have respect for those who are running it. I have respect for the property, and I have respect for some of the people here. But I don't have no trust in the government. Oh, the not, police, not the, government. the government. I don't. I don't. You know, um, uh, there was a Facebook post where one person had a thing, a, a little cartoon that said that um, Mrs. Clinton says she's going to start a, a, a nationwide tour, and she's going to restore confidence in the American government. And the uh, the small caption was when I when I start when I stop laughing. Because that's laughable that she would be the one that could restore confidence in the American government when she's the one up there lying about Benghazi. <clears throat> and Mr. President, this is for you. Uh, here you were talking about you have conclusive proof that certain gas was used by the Assad regime, and you can't tell us a year later what happened in Benghazi. So you have more um, information about what happened in Syria, where no Americans were killed, then you have a year after four Americans died, among whom was one, among uh, whom was um, the ambassador of the United States, where we don't have any answers one year later of what happened and where the president was the night that that occurred. I've heard a lot of reports that are very disturbing about what the president was doing and where he was when that was taking place. But we don't have any concrete information from the White House. Yet the, the president is sure that the certain uh, 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 gas that was in the tissue of those persons that died in the recent attack that was, uh, that was uh, provoked by the president's statements that was provoked by Assad on the 21st of, of August and then the Assad government saying that you don't know who you're dealing with out there. These are the rebels that, in fact, did it. And they're not beyond doing something to make it appear that the Assad government was, in fact, uh, doing it for the larger picture of taking power. Well, the Muslims believe, a lot of the Muslims believe anyway, let me say that before we get chastised. A lot of Muslims believe that if you injure, harm, or destroy, murder your own people in the process of going after the infidel, they also are just guaranteed a place in paradise as well. So when you got that kind of mentality, why wouldn't it be so unthinkable for them to actually do this. To you, understand it, you, you understand it uh, in, indelibly. Uh, that's exactly the scriptures of the, the, the scriptures of Islam. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, going through Muslims to get to the larger issue, which is a caliphate, that's just the uh, residual price you pay for bringing about the result that all Muslims aspire for. And if any Muslim tell me tells me that he or she is not for the caliphate, then they're telling me they don't believe in the Quran, and no Muslim is going to say that. There are some that, are in fact, uh, I don't. I, in fact, I don't think there are any. I, I just don't think we can we, we can start using words like moderate in terms like that when we're dealing with um, with Islam, because they all have a focus upon that which brings about the results that are called for in the Quran, and I think that, that the officials in Washington know that. But this president wants to bring about the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, and he did it in Egypt. And Al Qaeda and Hezbollah are the uh, 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 umbrella under the uh, Muslim bro uh, Brotherhood umbrella. It's just that they got two different uh, arms of it fighting against each other because there's a Shiite and Sunni fight that's taking place, <clears throat> and that's where you have Al Qaeda and you have Hezbollah. But this president, I don't think this president wants to get the Congress back just to have them to okay what he has said to his uh, aides he's going to do anyway. He's, he's, he's made it very clear that if Congress says uh, no, that's not going to stay his hand in terms of those missiles going because he's not going to put any boots on the ground. He'll do that as a, as a backup plan. So with that, if the Congress says no, it means no boots on the ground. But what does it mean if Congress says yes? And that's why I was posting that it may well be that we're looking at a guff of tongue in here in terms of uh, why the president wants to approve it because then the president has a cover that he had that he needs to expand upon what he first of all intended because I think he's going to do the other regardless of what Congress says. And then Congress, you got, you got a, 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 a test in your hand 
because although it's been done in the past, the mere fact the president said that it is his belief, he said it both before he became president in uh, 2007, he and Biden were saying it, that it, if, if Bush had gone into Iran, then Bush should be impeached and removed from office. So the president bowed down to that while he's president. So if he then calls Congress in the session, despite the fact it's been done before, without Congress approval, lunch and missiles and, and, and that without Congress approval, for him to call Congress in the session and then be told no and then go ahead with it, that's provocation. And it'll be interesting to see what Congress does in that in that particular um, in that in that particular uh, arena. But I think the president is trying to get more out of the deal than just launching missiles. Once they give him a resolution of approval, then the president can go beyond his limitations that he's quoted been quoted as saying he's going to limit himself. And that is just go in there and launch some missiles and come out and everything is, is, is fine. He can always claim there were some other things that Assad did that escalated the violence and the violence was escalated on his part and therefore we get to respond to it and then something else goes on. And before you know it, we have a full-scale war going in, uh, in Syria and now we have to have regime change. And I don't see how this president is, is going to be satisfied with leaving Assad in power, particularly with Assad over the thumb his nose at the United States, um, saying that uh, the president has blinked. And he does look pretty bad on, on the national uh, uh, stage, and he's looking very bad here at home as well. And how the president responds to that is going to be very interesting next week to, uh, to pay attention to. Keep your eyes on the prize over there, because we're, it's, not, it's not done yet. Uh, lastly, in, in Time Magazine, um, <clears throat> Assad says, uh, quote, that would go against elementary uh, logic. He's saying that it would be elementary logic not to use Syrian gas. Why would you want to provoke and give any excuse to bring in a third party when the two parties already involved in it, you have the upper hand? Why would you, just think about that for a second. Why would you want to provoke a party chopping at the bits to get involved in the war and then give them the stick to beat you with. That is making a sense. And I know, I know uh, based upon reports that the um, group is being decimated that's in the opposition. That, and I think it's why, they, why this, was, this was pulled out of the hat at the last minute. I don't think people are aware either that this is the 13th time that Syrian gas has been used in in Egypt, and I think that it, uh, each time it was it was for the same reason, used by the same group. I don't think Assad would be crazy enough to use it, and I am um, uh, 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 looking forward to next week because it's going to be it's going to get very interesting, particularly if Congress will stand its ground and we can begin to restore. Maybe out of this can come some good, where we begin to restore the check and balance system between the two branches of government in Articles 1 and 2, and we have some balancing that's going on here between the two, where we can have the president's authority restrained based upon what's allowed for in Article 2, and Congress can, in fact, restrain itself in terms of what it's allowed to do on Article 1, 1 Section 8, because there are restrictions that are placed upon both uh, parties, and maybe if, if this can be used to rein the president in, Congress can, therefore, be uh, made to see the hypocrisy or doing it in one case and not doing it in another, and then don't rein his, his own uh, power in. But keep your eyes open because uh, we're getting ready to see something very interesting here. And I hope that, I really hope that Congress will stand its, its ground and uh, require uh, this president to uh, go a different route because I don't see where the national interest is involved. I'm, I'm ready for the, for the case to be made, but I can't see how Al Qaeda or Hezbollah. Support neither one of these these persons would in fact serve the the na national interest. Neither one of these persons are good guys, and how either one serves our interest is is, is, is a case got to be made by the president. Okay, well, we are running out of time here, so we have to get back to um, basics, and that is to say, we want you to stay tuned to all the programs here at FlintTalkRadio.com, and of course, want you to follow your dream, because if you don't follow your dream. You'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.